Do we continue um, with our conversation? So we uh, created a panel. I'm first going to introduce the panel to you. So on the left, it's uh, Philip Lutz. I hope I pronounce it well. It's not Lutz, uh, I guess, yeah. From BNP Paribas Fortis. Um, then we have Michael Kurtz. I'm gonna ask him also to introduce himself a bit more than I now do. Michael Kurtz from MN. MN is a, I would say the good term is a pension delivery organization. They do the pension and investments for two, and for a few pension funds in the Netherlands owned by these pension funds. These pension funds have shares in this organization. So it's a, quite an interesting construct. Uh, and then we have Sebastian Godino from the WWF. Uh, EPO, what exactly is it again? Uh, European Policy Office, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So let me start with Philip. And this should be very interactive. Um, I have another mic. So whenever you wanna ask a question, even those here on the side that are doing whatever they are doing, if you want to ask a question, give me a hint. I come to you. And we just make the assumption that you can interrupt anytime you want. So even if somebody is speaking, you just hint at me and I give you the mic. And then with, with your own decency standards, you, you go into the discussion. But of course, I also have a few questions to ask uh, that we start off with. So we start with Philip. I think it's interesting to have a, a panel with three different organizations. So an asset owner type organization, pension fund an asset manager organization, and can I call you an NGO? Is that, yeah, so an NGO. So what I find interesting about an NGO at the table, by the way, is that in the 1980s when I was studying, Shell was doing stuff in, in, uh, in, in, in Africa that we didn't like. So what did we do as students or whatever? We targeted Shell directly. Right now you see NGOs targeting the asset owners that manage assets through asset managers, so that they can achieve something. So there's a different playing field going on. Yeah, but you do that on top of it. I know, I know, I know. Yes, but what, what I, my point is, there is more indirect targeting of asset owners and asset managers than before. And that is a changing world if you compare it to 30, 40 years ago. So I'm Philip, you are uh, at BNP Parties, Paribas Forces. Can you maybe first tell your, your job role or what you're doing there? Yeah, you can, you have to push it on, I think. Can you try? Do you hear me? Yes, now it is. Yeah. Okay, so I'm actually the, the program manager for, uh, responsible for the implementation of the different uh, regulation within Invest that touches sustainable finance and so SFDR, but also the amendments uh, of uh, MIFID and EDD regulation to gather ESG preferences and those within BNP Paribas Fortis. Uh, which for a part we are distributor, but also for a part we are asset manager for the discretionary mandate. So, okay. Thank you. So before we go to a question to Philippe, Michael, can you also introduce yourself? So let's do it like this and then Michael. Now it's on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm a fund manager on the uh, on, on the equities uh, side, but also heavily involved in in research, also on sustainability, and uh, specifically uh, also on uh, research to to innovate around the uh, elicitation of sustainable preferences uh, with some of our uh, with some of our clients. Sebastian, checking your email or <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, so my name is Sebastian, I'm senior economist in our WBF European Policy Office. It's a, a specific uh, WBF office working essentially on um, on European policy, which means we essentially focus on doing um, analysis and recommendations to EU policymakers, and we do lots of advocacy work with European policymakers, namely the Commission, the Parliament, and the Council, and uh, we're making them recommendations. And um, I focus with my team, Mathieu Lister, uh, speaking this afternoon, uh, we focus on, on financial policy at EU level to try to integrate some sustainability requirements in, um, in EU law for the private sector. We also have been working a lot on, um, on public, on European public finance. Thank you. <laughs> Philippe, 
So you are, uh, I guess, connected to an asset manager, which has a lot of different uh, um, services, asset management to institutional clients, to private clients. You are in the private domain or is it more at a general level? General level. General level. Okay, so how, how does this, maybe first a question, when did the topic of measuring sustainability or social preferences actually surfaced in your organization? So if you started uh, the exact date, I cannot tell you, but around 2018. Um, 2018, yeah. We started asking clients if, if they would like uh, a generic uh, way of managing their assets mm -hmm. or if they would like to include the ESG characteristics mm -hmm. in their uh, in the management of their okay. portfolio. So um, they could choose between one or both. Uh, and since then already we saw an increasing number of clients uh, going in the direction to have ESG integration in their management. So can you tell me how do you, so I come to your, your organization as sort of a wealth management part of it or the private banking with 50,000 euro. What happens if I do that in this respect of measuring preferences? How do you ask me? What do you ask me? Well, there is a... a Which one? This doesn't work? Yeah, it doesn't you, work. Can you, I think you have to sit closer to it. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so, what happens uh, if you come with fifty thousand euro, and how do we gather preferences? I think there is before the second of August, twenty twenty-two, uh, and mm -hmm. after the second of August, yes. twenty twenty-two. Tell us. Yes, yeah, so the, the Mifid delegate and an IDD delegated act uh, took place on the the second of August, which came with rigid uh, way of asking client preferences of. Uh, compared to before where it was more an unstructured way of discussing, uh, gather the, the client feeling around it, explaining what we do as a bank with our corporate client, what are our sector policies, uh, what are the characteristics of the product, uh, what if we are part of Paris alignment agreement, etc. So a story around it. Uh, and since the 2nd of August, um, we are required uh, to really perform uh, uh, preference gathering based on three basic criteria uh, which are known in the regulatory world as the abc uh, characteristic uh, a taxonomy aligned product uh, b uh, sustainable investment according to sfdr uh, and third uh, principal adverse impact from sustainable factors uh, so it becomes much more granular, but also much more technical to a client. We were talking before about financial literacy uh, and especially on sustainability. Main client, some of them are really interested and in go into the detail, but main client uh, wants to know, is it good? Is it better than the average uh, product? Uh, but not go into that technicality uh, of asking minimum proportion of taxonomy aligned product uh, minimum proportion of sustainable uh, sustainable product and principal adverse impact. Uh, what does it mean? Consider and mitigate. And every asset manager has another way uh, to do it. So for a client, uh, uh, comparing uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, investment, so the category D, asset manager can have their own methodology to assess what a uh, sustainable investment is. And if you propose a fund of BNP and a fund of Robeco, maybe in one fund you will have uh, Tesla sustainable, in the other one not because of governance issues. Uh, and for a client, this is really complex. It has become much more complex uh, to actually understand uh, what is behind it. Somehow, the way you describe it, it seems very supply driven, so that you tell them this is what we got and so where does the client come in in that process? So do you tell them this is the taxonomy and our product looks like that taxonomy? Or do you ask the client, what parts of the taxonomy do you want to have your portfolio connected to? Will we refer to the regulation because indeed it would be much easier to discuss the characteristic of product and see what matches with clients. Um, but actually the regulation forces us to be neutral and unbiased and non don't talk about the offering before having gathered the preferences. Uh, only after that you can engage in a discussion if you have matching or non-matching. Uh, but first it needs to be fully neutral and unbiased. Uh, so we have explanation, uh, info fiches, brochure, what is taxonomy, what 
is a FFDR that is of principal adverse impact, uh, but we cannot speak about the offering per se. So we need to ask questions. Basically, the client without any uh, any referral, and the intention of the law is also not matching, so not having a questionnaire that is offer driven. It needs to be neutral and unbiased. And even if the client asks for the moon, uh, we shall let him ask for the moon, even if nothing will be matching, because the behind goal is progressively also. So from the client expected wishes, uh, distributors uh, then will force us asset managers <laughs> to yeah. go so, in a greener yeah. direction. But so if I understand you correctly, so you, you show me, I go in with 50,000, you show me some questionnaire, yeah. something comes out that you interpret then, I guess, based on the questionnaire, and then you start talking about connection to taxonomy and whatever it is. Is that correct? Or First, sort of? explain what taxonomy yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, so yeah of course. Yeah and, then, yeah. and then indeed, we have those products matching these preference that you have, or those one, or those one, yeah. or we have nothing because the client is expecting in taxonomy really high percentages and in the market there is just not enough uh, at the day to day but since this survey is going to be unbiased as you said mm -hmm. you would almost expect that all the surveys are the same for all clients in the whole of europe because you know because they're if you want to ask it in the right way there's probably a few ways but not many ways mm -hmm unbiased so how uh, how does that work do you interact with other organizations on how to measure that is that is there an association of private banking and wealth organizations helping you to get a really good unbiased survey how does that work well so there is uh, yeah, there is banking right. association where the interpretation of the law is discussed but each uh, each company each bank uh, will draft their own preferences questionnaire uh, in the way yeah. they prefer to set it up uh, but of course, it needs to be neutral and unbiased in the eyes also of the regulator, so supervisory authority. And we go to our supervisory authority to present the questionnaire and they give remark and we adapt it, et cetera. Yeah. So it might differ a bit, uh, but the substance uh, as, it is, as it is regulatory driven shouldn't differ too much. Just fine. Can you give an example question you would ask me? Sort of a really important question in that, in that preference survey. Yes. Uh, uh, so if you have, if you show interest for uh, for sustainable preferences to integrate them, so I will ask you the three questions. Are you interested in more environmental sustainable investment? No, but supporting? first to get to the, first you say if you are interested in sustainable, how do you know that I am? Because we ask the first yeah, question. But what is, the, what is that question then? I'm just curious. Are you interested in integrating sustainability within your product or your management? Okay, um, good. Now this is, we need to have our facts straight, you know, thank you. Okay, so we go to a different context, the context of pension funds. I already told you, pension funds are in a different domain, uh, especially in the Netherlands. It's not a commercial market. I, people in the steel industry in the context of the funds that own MN have to be with that fund. But you are still, you, you probably, those organizations signed this covenant that I was talking about, and you you have certain, can you tell a bit about how you deal with that topic, like uh, measuring preferences? Yeah, so so indeed, the our clients uh, signed that, uh, uh, that um, uh, sustainable investing uh, covenant. Uh, where they then also made a pledge to uh, uh, to to do the uh, the participants research and uh, have been have been doing uh, doing that. Important to understand is that uh, not MN is uh, running the, the survey uh, for the client. We are advising on on the content, but in the end, each client runs their runs their own survey, also potentially with uh, with different uh, with, with different just questions. just for clarity. Client is here the pension funds that are client of MN, not individuals. Yeah. Yes, so our, our clients are uh, pension funds, nine nine different pension funds in the Netherlands, uh, two larger ones, uh, uh, several uh, several smaller ones. These uh, uh, pension funds represent between them around two million uh, participants. So the surveys are directed uh, at them, but our clients, from an end perspective, are not the uh, the, the participants, uh, but the uh, but but the pension funds uh, the pension funds directly. So, and, and you also have projects to measure these preferences or advice on it. How, do, how does that work? What have you seen that these clients do? Uh, so far, mainly uh, two approaches. One, um, yeah, just uh, a classical uh, surveys. Uh, 
the, the uh, participants receive surveys where there are questions asked uh, about their uh, sustainability preferences. Uh, do do they want more sustainable uh, sustainable investing? What uh, what themes within sustainability do they do they want to to focus on more or less? Also between environmental topics and uh, social topics, uh, for for example, and also questions around uh, engagements versus uh, versus exclusions. Uh, this is one element. Another element that uh, that has been done by our clients are uh, focus group uh, research to. Uh, invite smaller uh, smaller groups uh, uh, that are deemed representative for the, the population of the participants of a uh, particular fund uh, to, um, uh, to to get more in-depth uh, in-depth interviews with these uh, focus groups on essentially on the same topics as uh, are covered in the in the surveys uh, but to get a little bit more more insight in the uh, in, in the nuances of, uh, of of the preference and of the uh, beliefs that these uh, uh, funds are uh, that the participants of the funds are having so you just heard uh, in my presentation how that worked for the dutch pension fund detail handel do you find similar results over there or is it fully different because it's a completely different context steel people working in the steel type of industry yeah. uh, you know that's that's different Broadly, broadly speaking, in terms of uh, preferences uh, for sustainability, uh, preferences uh, around engagement, I would say it's it's pretty pretty similar mm -hmm. to uh, yeah what you reported in your research on the Thai handle, but also between the, the clients. Where you do see differences is in uh, uh, preferences for uh, for certain themes. So uh, the, the participants of some funds. Uh, want to see more action on specific themes than, than on others. So the, the, the ranking in terms of the importance of the yeah. different uh, sustainability themes there, I would say, is the, uh, is, is the biggest, uh, biggest difference. Yeah, maybe for the, for the audience. So the two biggest uh, funds are PMT and PMA, PME and PMT. And one of them is in a certain type of, this, of the steel uh, industry and the other and the other. But one of them decided to divest fully from fossil fuel companies immediately fully completely and the other says well we might but we first going to talk to it sort of as a, so you see already huge differences in the same context to uh, to to execute that was that also related to what the survey said or was this a board decision irrespective of the survey results do you know that uh, a little bit a mix of uh, of, of both so uh, you you mentioned it also in your in your presentation uh, earlier uh, to to include these uh, commitments uh, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. in surveys to basically have a have a vote to, to participants in surveys and there's a lot of uh, a lot of hesitancy of uh, uh, boards to uh, to to do that and uh, we we see this also with uh, with our clients ultimately the board want to retain uh, power to to make uh, to make decisions reason for it uh, being to to ensure that uh, certain trade-offs are made in, in a good way to to be sure that uh, minority voices around participants are not simply overruled by a majority mm -hmm. uh, decision that may uh, that may come out of a, a mm -hmm. of survey uh, results so the surveys on on such decisions like uh, uh, divesting from fossil fuel versus uh, uh, doing uh, doing more engagements first uh, those decisions are certainly heavily influenced by uh, by by the surveys, but uh, in the end, uh, the board also uh, has their has their voice on it, yeah. has their has their voice on the uh, on, yeah. on on the decisions. Yeah. Okay, Sebastian, you hear all this? Uh, being an NGO, European Policy Office, I now learn, so you know about all this legislation. Some of the legislation, probably not all. So, what do you think? Is this legislation now effective? If you hear this, is it is it going in the right direction? Are we missing something? Should I, should I give a brief policy? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so this is where I'm, two questions first. So I try to make something a bit structured because uh, there's more and more legislation, European legislation on sustainable finance and very clearly that's not finished. So I, um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a bit what can be relevant to this question. Um, obviously, what was uh, the first thing that was presented were, were the, um, the MIFID and IDB related acts. So that's only level two regulation. Um, and this is still foundational because this is the first time in EU law where it's required for financial advisors to ask retail investors their sustainability preferences. Huh? So that's, that's really a kind of game changer because that's the first time it's really mandatory in EU law. 
and that enters into entered into application early August. Um, however, there's already a lot of controversy. Uh, some investors find it rigid. I would say, well, this is not MIFID specific. Basically, every company finds regulation rigid on every issue, so that's that's not really MIFID specific. However, for this for this requirements, there are a couple of issues. Uh, one is that, um, as mentioned, you have three types of uh, um, let's say sustainability options which are required to be asked in MIFID and IDD. And they are framed in a way that is a bit technical. They are, um, I mean, they don't come from nowhere. They come from other EU regulations, but that doesn't mean retail investors are aware of it. The taxonomy and SFDR, they're not really uh, retail investor friendly. Eh? They are technical, they're also relatively new. So in the, uh, retail investors are not aware. Um, and also these delegated tax do not clarify what else the financial advisors should, uh, should ask while you have presented that sustainability issues are um, broad and complex. So I think only if these three questions obviously will not be enough to make sure the financial advisors knows more or less the, um, the, the, the detailed preferences of consumer, I mean, of retail investors on sustainability. And there's also another big problem, which is that um, this structure with three options in MIFID is not consistent with the uh, disclosure in SFDR on different uh, sustainable, sustainable funds. So that's the second file I wanted to raise. SFDR is a disclosure regulation for investors, asking lots of disclosures to investors in different ways. I, I pass the details, but there are three important articles, article six, eight, nine, which uh, require investors to disclose uh, by fund if the fund is not taking into account sustainability issues at all, so that's the article six fund, or if it takes some ESG characteristics into account in the fund uh, um, <laughs> composition, et cetera. So that's article eight fund, which have been summarized as, as light green funds. And there's also the article nine fund, which are called, I mean, nicknamed dark green funds with lots of debates, uh, which are normally invested in sustainable investments. Um, and uh, the problem is that it's not really detailed what this exactly means, and there's already lots of confusion. So given that this is not much detail, the ESMA, one of the three European supervisory authorities, is currently coming up with guidelines, and the European Commission is currently setting up FAQs to explain investors what this means. But um, this is still very confusing, and in my view, this will require to amend the level one SFDR regulation and clarify what should be uh, disclosed at Article 8 and what should be disclosed at Article 9 and Article 6. And I think this should be reorganized. I, I, I'll come to this in a minute. Um, there's a third file that is important to take into account, which is the EU taxonomy. It's another disclosure regulation in the sense that it's only requiring companies, uh, including financial institutions, to disclose their degree, uh, the proportion of taxonomy uh, uh, alignment or taxonomy aligned economic activities. So basically that's the, the green share in their um, business model or in their portfolio, huh? to make things very short. The taxonomy is also a slightly um, uh, complex to use. It's very new, so investors are not really well aware yet. And it's still an ongoing project because some granular criteria have been developed for the taxonomy to clarify if a given economic activity is green or not. You need to comply with different criteria. And um, it's very demanding. I mean, it's very time consuming to set up such criteria at economic activity, activity level is extremely granular, which means that uh, it's in the making. The green taxonomy is not finished yet. Uh, there are a hundred activities already with criteria for um, climate objectives, but there's nothing yet for biodiversity or water or whatever, other um, similar economy objectives. This is coming only next year. So that means the taxonomy will grow if it's not finished. Sebastian, does that mean that if the taxonomy changes and maybe also gets more ambitious or whatever you call it, do that, does it also mean that the 689 might change? Or well, is that is that a stupid question? Um, so, uh, article in NSFD Article 9, it's required to disclose the taxonomy alignment of your project, uh, of your, your, uh, your fund. So that, but that's only in Article 9. It's a bit different in Article 8 and 6. It's, it's looser. Uh, the taxonomy will become broader in scope, will cover more activities. So that means its kind of share of the, uh, of the economy will grow. 
Um, and, uh, but at the same time, the taxonomy criteria have uh, mandatory review clauses every five or three years. Um, and that means the criteria will um, gradually um, tighten, which is logical because you, on, on climate, on a climate perspective, you move from high carbon to low carbon to zero carbon. And so gradually, the activities will have to become zero carbon over time and to continue. Um, and uh, there's another important regulation we need to take into account, which is called CSRD. That's the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. That's a cross-cutting uh, um, cross uh, law at EU level to require companies to disclose sustainability information. So that's all sectors, including financial institutions, but only the large ones, huh? large, large ones above 250 stuff. And that's all issues, E, S, and G. Okay, so that's very cross thing. And um, this uh, will come up soon. This is already agreed at level one, so the primary legislation. But, but next year, there will be a secondary legislation attached to it, another delegated act on regulation, which will set a standard to clarify for companies how and what they should disclose exactly in terms of sustainability information. So that will become much more granular and much more specific. Uh, the EFRAG is working on this. It has proposed two weeks ago a draft um, standard to this, and the Commission shall adopt an act on this by um, end June next year. So it's coming very soon. Um, and it's still not very clear yet, to be honest, what indicators will be mandatory in the standard and what indicators will not. So it will still be options for companies to decide. But that means it will clarify a lot what companies will disclose, and that will help normally that should that should massively help investors to compare the environmental performance or the social performance and the sustainability performance of key companies which is normally really important because today with the current sustainability disclosure of companies it's extremely hard to compare their um, green performance right now so that's that should help a lot um that's what so even more coming Sorry? so even more coming yes yeah, yeah. Okay. so that's what already exists today that's there are more things coming there's a review of another file called PRIPS. PRIPS is a regulation on um, package uh, uh, products for retail investors. And in this, you have an obligation when you market a new fund to produce information beforehand to explain what's there, the fund composition, the strategy, the methodology, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, what the commission has committed is to introduce mandatory sustainability disclosure in every firm like this and to try to standardize them. Um, so that's very important because that means for every fund, you will have normally a sort of standardized uh, um, scorecard mm -hmm. or dashboard, let's say rather a dashboard, which will explain how this uh, that fund are sustainable and what they take into account and you will be become normally much more, much easier to compare them. And just mutual funds or what is this? What do you mean with fund? Well, we can go into the details, but normally, no, 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 normally no. that should be all retail investors funds. Retail. Yeah, retail. Um, and um, there's an, another thing that will come later. The commission has committed to review SAPR because it's already aware that the way Article 8 and 9 is defined is really confusing for investors. It's too general. And they will very likely, I mean, I think they will certainly come up with much more granular requirements for disclosing in Article 8 or in Article 9 category. They might clarify this. What we are asking them actually is to clarify Article 9 funds should be impact funds, and that should be evidence. And uh, the rest should be Article 8. Well, you can discuss if you need more categories, but I think but, that would be a yeah. critical yeah. differentiation to do. It's not a yet, it will not come in 20 it will be probably 2025. Um, and there's another thing I want to mention. That's the last one. Yeah, that's yeah, another. That's the last one. But be yeah. careful, it has <laughs> then to be made consistent. And so far, yeah. it's not really consistent because it's, you know, it's, it's moving forward in different ways. It's still a little bit patchy. You have political compromises, so it's not really consistent. And um, there's another file which is called in the jargon CSDVD. It's a a uh, directive requiring companies, some companies, to set up environmental and, and human rights due diligence uh, internally. And there's one article there requiring companies in the scope of the directive 
to set up climate targets and climate transition plans. This is very likely to pass because the council already agreed that specific requirement. There are lots of other issues on delivery, but on that requirement for companies to set climate targets and climate transition plans. The commission proposed it, the, the council okayed it, and the parliament is still negotiating its own position, but will very likely support it as well. So that means that from 2025-ish, companies will have to disclose this. And again, that should massively help investors to compare the peer companies in terms of their climate transition plans and their climate targets, and if they are aligned with a 1.5 degree Paris aligned that, um, climate pathway or not, compare the peers, et cetera. Um, so this also will have to be integrated in not only in the engagement strategy of the investors, uh, which is a, a big issue. Now, last but not least, they are still missing bits in the EU regulatory framework. What, what's missing? A lot, but there are still loopholes and gaps. Uh, a first key issue is that um, impact is not defined in EU law, which is a major gap. If you want to have an impact plan, it's just no definition. That means it is left to each and every financial institution to say, I called, I decide to call this an impact plan for this and that reason, for my own reasons. This is not legally defined. Um, so that means it will certainly have to come because the Commission, but also the European supervisory authorities, ESMA, EOPA, EBA, they're increasingly working on greenwashing and on impact issues with the risk of impact washing. Uh, there's something else missing, which are methodologies and tools to evaluate this impact. Because some people claim, oh, this is an impact plan. They just don't explain anything on it, or they have the in-house methodology, which might be totally inconsistent with another impact assessment methodology, and it might not even be um, disclosed, etc. So you have issues there. You also have a lack of EU rules on to regulate environmental claims. For example, you market a fund that is called my climate friendly fund. What does this mean? Can you really market this as a climate friendly fund? How do you evidence? How do you make sure it's not misleading for the investor? There are, well, there are rules at EU level, but that do not really work for um, financial products and for, for the financial system. And finally, there are issues in terms of oversight and supervision of uh, environmental claims for financial products and especially environmental impact claims um, to ensure this is really meaningful and not misleading for little investors. You claim I have a climate impact fund. You can market this as it. How do you prove it? How is it monitored by the regulator, the supervisor? Well, it's not really monitored properly as of today. Um, so you see that there's still a lot to come. And my own analysis is that um, this will become increasingly granular and sophisticated. So I think we are only at a very, very basic initial level. And for example, the MIFID IDD requirements for, you, for financial advisors to ask personal view preferences, what we think should be, should come with it is at least a kind of template questionnaire agreed by uh, the regulators or, and or the commission or others um, to, uh, to help financial advisors raise uh, relevant neutral questions to retail investors and have kind of meaningful comparable uh, um, outputs. Um, this does not exist yet, which means as, as we explained, each and every financial advisor is currently uh, allowed to set up its own questionnaire, its own way to ask clients and retail investors their personal preferences. And uh, in fact, you might say, well, this is really good. You have lots of market freedom, lots of innovation, etc." But at the same time, you hear many, many investors complaining that this is too confusing, this is too broad. They want the very clear guidelines to make sure they will comply with the, this MIFID obligation. And in fact, what they are doing in practice is they are asking something increasingly granular. They are asking guidelines from ESMA, they are asking FAQs from the commission. And what we, I think will clearly move forward is that in a few years there will be much much more granular requirements okay thank you Sebastian very uh, good overview I think it also shows that BNP Paribas needs a team or a person that knows what's going on there because how can you otherwise oversee all of this before I have some follow-up questions is there anyone in the room who already would like a question 
If so, please address the question to, to someone or all three of them. Yes? Not sure, I think it's on. Thank you. Uh, so maybe a very novice question in terms of uh, regulations and everything. Um, but how do you include uh, in your thinking and when you design those regulations, who the audience um, of those regulations are? Because I understand it's okay, it's targeted to uh, companies, but is the audience in the end the investors from on those companies or would the audience be much broader for any type of yeah, individual who is the client of those uh, investors. Uh, in terms of scope, uh, very clearly, uh, every single regulation has a different scope. That's another problem um, because sometimes it's inconsistent. Notably, what has been very inconsistent until now is that NSFDR is um, focusing on investors, requiring them to disclose quite a bit of information on sustainability. And then investors are saying, okay, but in that case, if I'm required to disclose, I need to get this, this sustainability information from my investing company, at both for my at portfolio level, but also at fund level. And um, this disclose sustainability disclosure requirements at company level for the investing companies until now was very poorly available, which means there's a gap. Investors are required to disclose something that is currently largely unavailable or unavailable with Poor quality, unreliability, uh, impossibility to really compare, complexities, etc. This normally should be uh, fixed by the standard coming under CSRD, but you, you have these differences in scope, which are usually related to political compromises at the level between the Council, the Commission, and the Parliament. In, in, in practice, and in general, everybody is asking for consistency, everybody likes consistency, but in fact, what we notice is that there are always uh, trade-offs and political bargaining and compromises, which usually means it ends up with inconsistent things. And that's very problematic um, because it complicates a lot the, uh, the regulatory framework for investors, for companies, etc. So in our view, in my view, consistency is a must. As I explained, for example, SFDR and NIFI requirements are not consistent. If you disclose a fund as an Article 9 fund, it doesn't tell you much, I mean, it doesn't tell you enough to answer um, the, the sustainability preferences requirements in this case and this is itself. So it's still not consistent. So very clearly, uh, different regulations will have to be reviewed to gradually ensure uh, this consistency. And you didn't even mention the word lobbying. You said political bargaining. Well, it so yeah. sounds a bit more positive than yeah, uh, the political lobbying. Bargaining is not yeah. always related to yeah. lobbyists. Yeah. Yes. At, in Brussels, there are something like 30,000 lobbyists, at least 80% working for private interests, a lot for financial interests. And um, compare this with 700 MEPs. So you have 30,000 lobbyists trying to meet MEPs on a weekly basis. They have 700 MEPs. They are constantly lobbied like hell for different, for taking into account this interest and that. Yeah. And sometimes they do something they shouldn't do. Okay, um, Philip, you you heard all this, and and Michael as well. So there's all this legislation trying to help you as an investor. So how do, how do you feel that in, in your context for us? Is is this SFDR, CSDD, CSRD? Is it helping you to be a better asset manager or to be a better private banking or wealth management organization, or is it more or less hampering if you would compare the situation before, let's say, the first of August? I would not say hampering, uh, I would not say helping neither. So first of all, as uh, uh, Sebastian took back, it is a rigid regulation, yes, uh, but we are fully supportive of, of, of it because the last years, as you mentioned before, with the five globes of Morningstar sustainability was going in all direction. So having standards for the end investor to be able to know what is and what is not sustainable is definitely uh, something that, that should take place. Uh, the, the main issue right now for institutions, but also at the end for uh, uh, clients, uh, is the sequencing of these regulations, because we are asked to uh, gather the preferences in the way that regulation defines it uh, as of the 2nd of August. Uh, 
but as Sebastian also mentioned, taxonomy, for example, we only have two categories out of six and it's unfinished. And out of those two categories, only big companies will have to report on it in the first sense until CSRD, the second year, which is 2026. So for the moment, it's a limited scope of thematics, let's call them like that, and activities linked to those. And it's only for big companies. So if investors are willing to invest in taxonomy because it's the greenest, the greenest standard, let's call it like that, well, funds will be allocated towards only big companies because it's the only data that is available mm -hmm. because the regulator also tell us that we are not uh, allowed to use estimates. And so on one side, uh, we ask uh, uh, about one of those, of those three categories, which technically before 2025 uh, or even 2026, the scope of data will be really reduced. So it's like a gap of three to four years. And SFDR, another one, well, indeed, uh, we launched it. The level two of SFDR was not even there because it started the 1st of January. And indeed, it's also unfinished. So it's more the sequencing of the regulation that we need to ask uh, client preferences to then, therefore, afterwards, tell them that there is not yet enough data. We cannot match this because it's not in the market. Uh, so it creates, uh, so from the client point of view, but why do you ask the question if you cannot yeah. provide anything? So it's a bit uh, uh, incoherent yeah. in the timeline and in the perception of the client. Of course, we have to also be a bit patient uh, before it all starts kicking. But what I was wondering while you were saying this is how this relates to the procedure of measuring risk preferences, which you are used to. Mm -hmm. And you somehow have to merge those two. And what I understood from some of the things I read is that there also has been some lobbying to give some more weight again to the risk preferences so that you don't forget about the financial objectives of a, a decision and just look at sustainability. How, how, is that, how is that merged, the two of them? How do you do that? The flexibility you talk about is not actually really there. So indeed, in the guidelines from ESMA, they do recall that sustainability comes after the risk profile. Yeah. So first, you need to find a suitable option for the risk profile. And only after that, you look if you have something for sustainability preferences. That's it's quite interesting, isn't it? Is it? I find that remarkable that you are forced to do it like that. So you force the individual to make a decision in a certain way to someone, or am I misinterpreting this? You're misinterpreting because at the end, uh, they also say that you cannot propose something that is not in line, for, you cannot propose proactively something that is not in line with the ESG preference. So yeah, uh, so what they say is uh, in, the, in the guidelines of ESMA, uh, you need to fix first the risk and then look at the sustainability features if you have not got something that matches both, uh, first you need to look at the risk, uh, and then you ask, you need to ask the client if he's willing to review down or adapt his preferences uh, for this transaction, because you cannot match his ESG preferences. Uh, so you have to proactively ask him before proposing. Uh, it's almost it's like a ritual dance that you have to do across those two preferences. Sebastian, you want to chip in? Short. Yeah. Oh, it should be. It should not be a financial risk profile first, you know, set in stone, and then sustainability preference. Because if the client is proposed, well, I have these different options for you in terms of sustainable funds, and this fund is an impact fund, it's really strong guarantees that you will have an impact, but it might be more financially risky. Then some clients, I think, would agree to change their risk profile if, if they have the guarantee that this impact fund, they put the money in, has a way a much stronger potential to deliver real impact. Um, so I think it should be back and forth. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it can be heavily debated whether today we have strong um, and reliable processes or labels to, to clarify what an impact fund is and the likeliness to really have impact unfinished. I don't disagree with your statement. It should go, but ESMA doesn't allow it. Um, ESMA doesn't allow that the ESG preference Can you to the not impact. sneakingly still try it once in a while? Is that not, doesn't work like that? No? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, Michael, so you heard all the legislation, which in your context, institutional investing is a different one. So the SFDR, I think the pension funds were actually quite surprised by the fact that they suddenly were also falling under SFDR. I can remember that a few years ago. So how did you deal with that? How did you deal with all these legislation? Does it help you do your job? I'm not sure I would agree with uh, a surprise. So there was quite a, a quite an involvement uh, from also specifically from the pen, from the large pension fund uh, sector. Um, generally, uh, I would say that the view is uh, is quite positive on on the regulations in the sense that it that it helps that it helps uh, clarifying what is sustainable that it that it helps clarifying uh, what is impact. Uh, this also helps the pension funds communicating towards their uh, towards their participants, uh, yeah, because it simply clarifies. It, it gives definitions and it gives clear uh, clear guidance how certain elements have to be have to be measured. What is a problem, though, is uh, what I also uh, heard so far from from the others is the the, the sequencing of the, uh, the the regulations. It is a, a problem for the practical implementation if. Uh, uh, our clients as pension funds have to report first on certain sustainability dimensions before uh, uh, companies we invest in have to actually provide us with the uh, with, with with the data that uh, creates a gap that makes the the whole implementation more uh, more more difficult in the end. Yeah, but I think, I guess the regulatory offices in all the countries will probably take that into account or not, or is that or are they like policemen saying you're not doing a good job? There are certain dates when we have to when we have to report, and these dates don't really align with when the when the companies have to. Yes, but then you don't report exactly what they want from you. Then the regulator knows that you don't have the information. So, yeah, so how can they expect from you to do we, it? Then? We, are, we are working with. Uh, we actually can work with uh, with estimated uh, okay. data, okay. but uh, yeah. that provides its its own its own challenges because you you have to evaluate the estimation uh, the estimation methodology. And uh, when the numbers eventually uh, come in from the uh, from from the companies, uh, and those numbers are different from the the estimates that were first uh, used, then of course the uh, yeah. the reporting may may change, which then has its own own communication challenges. Yeah. It's it's it's. I'll go come to you in a sec, but it's quite interesting anyway that you report, for instance, on CO two or greenhouse gas emissions. You sell some stuff and then you have a lower score on that. Whether that makes a dent in the first place is a totally other discussion that we are not don't have the time for. So there's the actual relevance of all that is also a big discussion. Jim, it's just a question around soliciting uh, sustainability preferences in this context where Philip mentioned that each manager's got a different definition of sustainable investment. So put taxonomy that's well defined, PII is well defined, but sustainable investment. Who you, whoever you ask, you'll get a different answer in terms of what that looks like. So how do you explain that to clients and solicit preferences related to something which in, in inherently is undefined? It's an excellent question. <laughs> Look, I will say as a distributor side of things, uh, uh, we we carry due diligence on third party asset managers uh, because of course for the asset manager of BNP we know what the policies are and we know what is in there so we we conduct due, uh, due diligence uh, and we assess if they can be proposed proactively or not but technically yeah explaining the different uh, uh, methodologies of different asset manager to a regular client. Uh, it's basically impossible because it's pages and pages of, uh, within SFDR that are too technical and won't understand. So at the end, you are comparing apple and oranges because you are forced on some, because it's a disclosure by the asset manager. So you cannot do otherwise. If uh, manager A says, I have 30% sustainable investment, uh, manager B 40, but at the end, the methodology is completely different. Uh, yeah, we'll have to report on this asset manager and consider that he has 30% of sustainable investment, but those two managers will have completely different methodologies and same stocks, same bonds uh, could be considered in another way. Uh, so SFDR imposes more transparency, which is a good thing, but it doesn't say what is a sustainable investment. Uh, it's up to the asset manager 
and going to the detail of each underlying sum for a, for a regular client is just impossible. So you compare at the end percentages of sustainable investment within funds that cannot really be comparable because yeah, it's apple and oranges. Briefly, because I, I just got a hint that we have five minutes left. I think it's really, really interesting to, to, to see this paradox. You know, investors are marketing sustainable funds for what, 20 years. They say, oh, this is sustainable. You can trust us. Really very interesting fund for you. And now they are required to disclose whether the fund is sustainable or not. And they say, oh, we, we don't know. And it's because, I mean, the, the, the legal requirement is not asking us how it's sustainable, but sometimes they have been marketing this fund as sustainable for, for decades. Mm -hmm. So there's really, really a big mismatch between what they are marketing and what they are reliably disclosing uh, with potential compliance and liability issues. Um, I think that's super important to, to take into account. And there's something else that is important, which is, uh, again, I mean, there are sustainable funds that are marketed for a decade. Um, and uh, you know, with data, ESG the, um, uh, ratings, et cetera, which are um, disclosed for years and presented for years with different uh, rating agencies telling, for example, uh, we have 300 ESG data points per each listed company. So this is super robust. And now some mandatory disclosure, sustainability disclosure requirements come up. And what's the reaction of the market? Everybody says, oh, we, we can't comply. We don't have the data. So there's a big mismatch in terms of what is, is marketed and what seems to be the reality behind the scene. Um, and that also shows one thing, which is that apparently the market alone is not able to come up with the necessary and relevant um, sustainability information at corporate level, at fund level, et cetera. And this, this means it's why it's necessary to come up with a mandatory system, which of course will, will come up with unavoidable burden sometimes inconsistency, et cetera. Uh, but just because the market alone is just not able to do this properly, investors are systematically telling us, you cannot force us to disclose this because we don't know if our com investing companies don't tell us, we have no clue. But they keep claiming for years, oh, we are su super sustainable. Yeah. We select the investing companies in a very tough way. You can trust us. Can I add something just to, go to clarify also? Uh, because if we're talking in the concept of SFDR, so asset manager, when they disclose the percentage, they disclose their methodology. So they say what is sustainable. What is unclear for the retail uh, investor is how do they compare these two methodologies? Uh, and also at EU level, because the ESA just asked the European Commission to clarify the what methodology is accepted in the eyes uh, of the Commission, because a lot of Asset manager have a binary approach. Um, they, ap they apply a filter, 20% uh, aligned to an SDGs or whatever. Uh, and if you will go through all the filters, boom, you're a sustainable investment for 100%. So it's zero or 100. You have others uh, that looks at the proportionality and try to look at the economic activities. Uh, and then you don't have, and this is not even clear for the European Supervisory Authority that they asked the European Commission to clarify. So therefore, why I said to compare two methodologies for a retail Stop. investor, it's quite complex at this stage. I think it's, it's, it can be also quite frustrating for the organizations. You say that we're already doing this for 20 years and now suddenly are not able to provide information, but they also see a lot of new entrants into the sustainable investment markets who could misuse the current regulation to provide products that aren't really sustainable or do not really measure well what's going on. But we don't have time for that. We have only time for one short question and a brief answer by Marco. Uh, thank you, Rob. So uh, based on research from colleagues at Maastricht, right, they, they look at this, um, this demand for sustainable finance and they ask, how is it met in the supply, right? And they find that on average, uh, sustainable funds require higher fees than non-sustainable funds. And I was wondering whether com um, combined with these changes in regulation, right? Uh, whether this also dr drove a change in the supply from your side. So if you have, okay, you, you realize people want some types of funds that you don't have in your in your manual of offerings. This, does this then uh, lead to a change in, in, in what you're offering? And does it also come with, with more expensive fees, so to speak? 
Well, based on demands of client, of course, we'll always try to answer the, the demands of, uh, of our client. So if we don't have in our offering, whether we'll have uh, to find it, uh, if it exists, whether we'll have to engage in discussion with the asset manager to push higher uh, the, the level of sustainability of the fund that we propose uh, and matches the, the, the client needs, uh, which of course can have as a consequence potentially higher fees. We still don't see it uh, today in the, in the OCR of the funds and so the ongoing fees. We don't see yet uh, the difference. Uh, and uh, there was also a study uh, by uh, European Commission that actually uh, SRI funds were not uh, necessarily uh, more uh, uh, more expensive than regular funds. Uh, but it will depend, of course, asset manager will say, well, I need uh, that many new data points, that many uh, uh, data that I have to source, that I have to keep, that I have to store, and so many new disclosure, I need new teams. Uh, if their cost goes up, uh, of course, as a business, it can be that they try to to uh, to adapt their pricing accordingly. Mm. Can be a consequence. Mm. But I think that study also shows that if clients, in in the context of financial advisors helping clients, that they charge more to financially illiterate clients, that I find interesting. Then the agency issue comes up. Uh, so, and that financially literate clients were not charged more by these financial advisors. So maybe we should bring that to lunch because uh, I see Anna, I feel Anna is burning in my back. <laughs> we have to stop, but there is of course also an agency issue going on. You could lure clients as a, even following ESMA guidance fully into high fee private equity funds because you ask the questions in a certain way at first and then you show stuff that is linked with the taxonomy, but whether that then is really a good thing financially and even sustainably for that client is very questionable. I think you can misuse that. The way I hear what you've said today, uh, you can do this. There's a lot of room for misusing the regulation. I think that is definitely something we don't want. Regulation that brings us a step back. Well, with this very bad negative notice, I would like to thank the three participants